A social media post was encouraging people to storm Area 51 to see if the aliens were really there. More than a million signed up. Area 51 was big news. America's vast Mojave Desert holds mysteries and secrets both ancient and modern. From the remains of past civilizations to the trails of pioneers. From once thriving ghost towns to the decaying remnants of old mines. From modern cities to strange military bases. The Mojave is at the center of some of America's most persistent mysteries. At its heart, is the most infamous, deepest, driest, and hottest desert in the world, Death Valley. I'm Ted Fay, and for nearly two decades, we at Gold Creek Films have researched, investigated, and told the stories, myths, and legends of this notorious desert. But one subject has persisted since the beginning, the rumors and tales that beneath its grand bordering mountains there exists a colony of Death Valley aliens. For a lot of reasons, it seemed that now was the time to explore the subject. I brought on Gold Creek team member Tim France. Tim's first-hand knowledge of the places and stories of the Mojave is second to none. He seems to have been to nearly every corner of its vast expanse, and when I called him to set up a meeting, he said the timing was perfect. He'd been researching the subject extensively, and he wanted to meet in a park. I've been noticing an uptick in these stories and these legends or tales for the past year and a half. And then after the Senate hearing with the DOD on the subject of UFOs, there seems to be even more interest in this subject. Some people are even saying that the earthquakes have something to do with it. I, honestly, I was I was going to talk to you about that. Because, you know, we just had the big 7.1 earthquake. I mean, we haven't had an earthquake for 20 years. And uh, here we go, Ridgecrest and Trona, all the little desert towns are shaking. Is, is that significant? To some people, it is significant because uh, I, I started seeing an increase in videos on YouTube of people saying that this is because of the alien underground base under China Lake, and it's our government fighting this alien presence that are hidden underground. Well, so there's an underground battle going on between aliens and the military, and that's causing this whole uproar in the uh, in the Earth's crust? It could be, because um, one of the stories that I've actually been noticing lately, it, it kind of blew me away when I saw that, is there was this group called Majestic 12. Majestic 12 basically made an agreement with aliens that we will give them land in exchange for technology, the government's allowing them to abduct a certain amount of people for testing. Before we get too far along, let's review the basic foundations of UFO and alien conspiracies. The first thing to know is the Roswell incident. In 1947, near the Roswell Army Airfield in New Mexico, a rancher found the wreckage of something on his property. It wasn't long before the Air Force showed up and recovered it. They issued a press release stating that they had recovered a flying disc or flying saucer. Within a day, the Air Force revised the story, describing it as just a weather balloon. It probably would have been forgotten if not for UFO researchers like Stanton Friedman. Between 1978 and the early 90s, he and others interviewed eyewitnesses to the Roswell event, including the rancher who had discovered the wreckage. There were enough inconsistencies with the government account and enough corroboration of witnesses to suggest that the wreckage was that of an extraterrestrial spacecraft and that the aliens were indeed here. And most importantly, it suggested that there was a cover-up by the government. Friedman and the researchers used the Freedom of Information Act to gain access to government papers. Former insiders also leaked documents. One of those leaked was an alleged executive order by President Harry Truman in September 1947, shortly after the Roswell incident. That order formed the Majestic 12, 
a code name for a top secret committee of scientists, military leaders, and government officials to facilitate recovery and investigation of alien spacecraft. Its mission has since expanded over the years, including cooperation with aliens, creating alien colonies, and reverse engineering alien technology. Reverse engineering meaning that engineers can take an existing spacecraft and figure out how it was built and how it operates. Enter Area 51. Though no one's quite sure how it got its name, the official designation is Groom Lake, named for the dry lake bed salt flat that made it the perfect site for a new air base in 1955. The facility was established by the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to develop a high-flying spy plane called the Lockheed U-2, a quote, strategic reconnaissance aircraft, end quote as it was officially called. From the days of this first project, the base has been top secret. It's run by the U.S. Air Force and is within another facility called the Nevada Test Site. In 1955, the Cold War was intensifying and both the U.S. and Russia were trying to spy on each other without detection. Secrecy was top priority. Groom Lake, or Area 51, surrounded by several ranges of mountains and isolated in the Mojave Desert was the perfect place to keep new technology out of sight. During the late 1950s and 60s, there was an increase in sightings of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, particularly in and around Groom Lake and the Nevada Test Site area. The Nevada Test Site was also where above-ground nuclear testing was being conducted, so Nevada residents in Las Vegas and rural communities around the base could watch giant mushroom clouds from what they knew were nuclear tests. But at other times, there were objects flying in the sky that were seemingly of unknown origin, UFOs but there was never any reference or acknowledgement of these unknown flying objects. Then came Bob Lazar. In 1989, Lazar was interviewed and claimed to have worked at Area 51 on reverse engineering alien spacecraft. He told of underground facilities and multiple alien ships being worked on in giant hangars beneath the desert mountains. In addition, allegedly aliens known as the Grays have been working with humans for thousands of years and are presently at Area 51. The stories over the years have grown to include other bases and even parks where aliens have colonies. One of these is Death Valley. Stories have persisted of an underground civilization there encountered by both early Native Americans and later by pioneers, prospectors, and even promoters. Death Valley is surrounded by military installations and other sites where underground colonies of aliens are alleged to exist. There's the army base of Fort Irwin to the south, a strange place named Lida to the north, the Nevada test site to the east, a seemingly innocent ranching location to the northwest called Deep Springs, and a naval base in the desert to the west that is just as secretive as Area 51 called China Lake. Well, supposedly, the aliens under China Lake and under Deep Springs have been violating their agreement. Hmm. So the U.S. government has started taking care of the issue, supposedly. So you mentioned those places, and, and you've even said that, that there's a network of underground tunnels and underground transport systems for aliens and bases and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a, so that you know. Um, little backstory I have a friend who's really into this stuff yeah, yeah. I, uh, with me I take it as any type of legend um, Native American urban legend I just take it as a legend uh, to me I, I see it as face value right but again because of the uptick I went to my friend and I asked him about the supposed underground basis right and this is what he gave me so 
what in the world is this? Supposedly, this is a map showing the actual underground basis. The circles are the actual basis. And the lines are the generalized location of where these tunnel systems that connect these underground bases are located. Wow, so they go all over. I mean, from Tulsa to Colorado Springs to Carlsbad to Chihuahua, Mexico. And, and it looks like Tonopah, Nevada is kind of a hub. Yes, there is a mountain up there called Quartzsite Mountain that it's rumored to be a multi-level underground alien base, which is, and Quartzsite Mountain is actually located in the test site. Huh. So, so let me ask you this. Before we get into the test site and some of these locations and where some of these bases may be and everything, you had said there there's, could be a, a connection to ancient writings on rocks that, that would actually indicate where some of these tunnels might be. There's a lot of petroglyphs here in the southwest. Well, it's interesting because if you're talking about petroglyphs, you're talking about things that are very old, right? I mean, that even predate the Native Americans here. Many of them do. Uh, the groups that are currently here in the Nevada and Eastern California, they came here roughly around 1100 AD, okay. give or take a few hundred years. But you can tell the difference between which ones predate the groups that are here and um, which ones are done by the groups here by how bright they actually are in the rock. Well, I guess my point is that if, if some of these hints are hundreds of years old, which predates any American sightings of UFOs and aliens and that sort of thing, what's, how do we make the link between an ancient tunnel and an alien civilization, or or is there no time to aliens? It's because you got to figure time is a construct that we've actually developed mainly for the planting of crops. <laughs> All right, so they, when we started agriculture tens of thousands of years ago, yeah, we needed a way to determine when it's best to plant the crops, mm -hmm. and that's basically when time started. Right. So a civilization may get to the point to where it doesn't need the time anymore. Some years earlier I interviewed author and researcher Michael Cremo on the relationship between ancient civilizations and present-day alien bases. In some cases we find accounts of these sorts of things, lost civilizations being found in caves beneath the earth as at Death Valley, changing over time. You know, people initially uh, attributing them to remains of some ancient civilization, perhaps in more modern times, attributing them to the influence of UFOs and extraterrestrials. I think at some deeper level, the two things aren't that much different. Uh, whether we're talking about ancient wisdom tradition, traditions that speak of us being in a cosmic hierarchy of beings, or if we talk about the modern UFO alien abduction type of phenomena, I think they're just two versions of the same thing. The idea that we live in a multi-level cosmos with each level inhabited by different kinds of beings, and with also the possibility of beings on our level interacting with beings on other levels, or vice versa. I think this is essentially the same kind of phenomenon, just going under different names. It begins to pose a really interesting question that are there trails that Native Americans or even the petroglyphs would indicate to us that overlap with a map like this that somebody made that would be based on more current technology. Since I started looking into this um, phenomenon of underground bases and such, I've noticed a link with the traditional ritual sites or spiritual mountains here in the southwest hmm. and followed their links and it's amazing how many times that they actually will cross over a particular point on this or be very close to an existing underground base. Well, that's, that's amazing. And that actually gets to exactly what this project is all about. Really finding those links between the, the, old, uh, the old technology, as it were, to try to discover and, and connect with these alien tunnels and bases and the modern technology and what we know about where these places might be. So in our travels, 
I understand you're going to be our tour guide, basically, and take us to these places where you believe they, they not only overlap, but they kind of come in sync, and, and we actually may be able to see both layers of of the ancient and the modern technology in one place. Is that, is that what we're talking about? I'm so intrigued with the native culture and legends and stories. And because I'm a firm believer, every legend has a grain of truth. Mm. So there are legends or there's even petroglyphs of alien or UFO encounters. And the petroglyphs are just amazing because that's just written in stone. That That's not forgotten. It, it, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's not where, oh, did he remember correctly from his grandfather the story? No, it's actually carved in hard rock. It's carved in stone, written in stone. So, Tim, this adventure that we're going on actually takes us to some of the most secure, guarded, and potentially some of the most dangerous places in the world, right? Yeah, well, we are actually going to be spending a uh, time along the northern border of the test site, or Area 51 as people call it, because a lot of these spiritual sites are just north of the test site or literally just over the border in the test site. Wow, so that we're actually going to sort of be... We don't want to get in trouble with anybody. That's not our intent. We're not, we're not those guys that go out and try to cross the border and see what's going to happen. But we are the guys that want to circumnavigate this base, try to see as much as we can, and try to see what in terms of the base itself, with where there are rumored to be tunnels and colonized areas of aliens that line up with the ancients, right? Yes, and there, there is uh, one particular mountain. It's a, a it's a sacred mountain, and I'm not gonna I'm gonna keep the name a surprise for right now. Yeah. But we are gonna actually be so close that you probably can hit it with a spitball. My quest to find out about Death Valley aliens is taking us to regions around Death Valley. What seemed to me would be a direct visit to the Valley of Death is turning into anything but. We head to eastern Nevada, then we go north. So you say right now we are actually running parallel to Area 51, is that right? Yeah, the Area 51 is due west of us. Right now we're heading north, so we're going to actually be on the um, northern border of Area 51. So how, how secure is this? I mean, as I, as I look across the the mountains there and I see sort of this green here in front of us because we're sort of a oasis area in the desert, right? Yes. Right now? Um, uh, right, right now we're in Brannigan Valley. There, a lot of ranching, a lot of farming went on in this area for years. Right. And there's a wildlife refuge right here? Yes, it's farther south. Of, so there's a lot of tourism and everything that goes up and down here, right? Highway 93 in Nevada here? Yes. This is also one of um, main trucking routes to get to the remote areas of Nevada. How much of it do you think is a sort of a, a buffer between here and what some would consider the most secretive base in the world? Uh, quite a bit of a buffer. Uh, to get to Groom Lake, you have a minimum of about four mountain ranges to your west. And these are little mountain ranges. These are actually very vulnerable. So, Groom Lake is what exactly in relationship to Area 51? A lot of military aircraft are tested in this area because it's just a perfect area. You have a nice wide open range of this ancient lake bed. It's a dry lake. It's a dry lake. No, there's not a lake at Groom Lake. Correct. Right. Um, so you have this beautiful wide open area far from peering eyes. And what better place to test aircraft? Right, right. Because right, right now, what you don't realize, yeah. we, we are totally in controlled airspace right now. Now, when you say totally controlled, what does that mean? This is what they call an MOA. It's a military operation area. Okay. And this is airspace that is controlled by the military. So I guess what I'm getting at is even though, you know, you may stop at some place and things look nice in your little restaurant or whatever in this neck of the woods, everything is really kind of controlled and under the Department of Defense, right? Nellis that actually controls this airspace. And Nellis is the Air Force Base. Yes, north of Las Vegas. Is Nellis the entire base under which Area 51 falls? Or is that a separate is that a separate base? That's totally separate. Now Nellis is different from the test site. 
It is different from the test yes. site. Yes, I see. Not only do you have the Department of Defense, you also have the Department of Energy and a couple other agencies that operate out here. All of that kind of uh, technology, all of that just sort of comes up when you're in this neck of the woods talking about Area 51, the test site, Nellis Air Force Base, all of those military operations that are just you know, hidden from us that we don't know about, and uh, you know, go on, go on on a daily basis. I mean, they must be doing something. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the largest base that doesn't exist. Okay, this is where I want to take you. Now, those Indian legends about craft and beans from beyond the stars. Right. It was just up here. So, just through the fob wire fence which we get to disengage. Yes. So let me go ahead and open this up and we'll head right in. All right, sounds good. When Tim got out to open the gate, I knew we were starting on an adventure. Remote fenced gates are designed to keep most people out. But Tim had been up in this area enough times, so I figured he knew what he was doing. Not only that, but even though we were seemingly far from Death Valley, we felt it was important for us to go to this place to understand anything at all about Death Valley Alien. Is that Area 51 on the other side there? No, we're a little bit too far north right now. We, 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 we are about, oh, I would have to say about 10 miles north of Area 51 right now. So where we're headed right now has to do with the Indian lore, the, the petroglyphs you've talked about, and, and all of that kind of thing. That is, that is absolutely correct. This, this whole area is really beautiful. I mean, every time I come to Nevada, I, I really fall in love with the landscape, the, how so quickly you can become so remote. Like, back there is the paved highway, but we've just gotten off for a few miles, and, and we I don't think we've got a few miles yet, and, and I feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like you said, I mean, I think our quest is more to really determine if there's evidence for the underground tunnel transports and the bases and if there's any evidence at all from history, prehistory, petroglyphs, Native American stories, wherever the information might come from that would help us with this. Okay, we are in the petroglyph area, so let me find myself a parking place. Okay, you remember those Indian petroglyphs I was talking to you about? Right, right. Well, I have something very special to show you. Well, always looking for a new angle, I put on a chest mount camera to follow Tim towards the petroglyph site. So Tim, you're saying that these petroglyphs are unique and all the petroglyphs you've seen through Nevada and through your wanderings through the West, that these are special. They are very special, especially if you're a uh, UFO investigator. Yeah. And trust me, wait until you see these. What, what am I seeing here? You have this craft here. You have this very large beam with what looks like a third leg or third appendage. Here, you have two other people or two other figures that don't look the same. They're a little bit bulkier. One of them looks like he's actually carrying a shield. Ancient drawings, thousands of years old, seem to show what looks like a saucer-shaped disc. The skinny creature next to the disc is clearly a different being than the figure to the right, with what appears to be a shield. Was this an ancient confrontation with an alien? Is the figure on the far right running away? These are the types of surface indicators that we were looking for. So far I have found 18 of them. Like this? similar to this, but with craft that look very similar to this, all the way up to about 600 miles away. We saw on that map that Tonopah was kind of the hub of these tunnels. Yes. So let's say within a radius of Tonopah, is there any connection there? Or does it look like there's anything in, in that sort of radius like we saw with the tunnels? Where I found these petroglyphs, you have Groom Lake, Quartzsite Mountain, the Lida area, which is extremely spiritually charged to the Shoshone and Paiute. The Tonopah airfield and a couple other zones that supposedly there are underground bases located at. Oh, wow. 
Tim, so I see this here. That is, that's amazing. Now, remember when I said, pay attention to the third appendage? Yeah. Look at that right there. I see. Now, what's neat about this is you have the body. Yeah. Okay. Then you have a hard peck on the legs, the third appendage, and the arms. Okay. Look at the eyes. They left the eyes alone. So it's almost kind of like a ghostly haunted yeah, look. They're like there, right? But they're like hollowed in a little bit? That's, yes. That's crazy. But, but does this relate to our alien petroglyph? It does, doesn't it? I, I believe it relates to the alien petroglyph be mainly because of the third appendage. This is, this is really fascinating. It's like you don't really know what to do. This is another good time to check in with Michael Cremo on the connection between ancient writings and modern UFOs. If we listen carefully to the accounts of various Native American peoples, we'll see that they speak about such things as flying canoes and different kinds of craft that they've seen moving in the air or that are part of their traditional understanding of how the world operates. And I think we find this in many ancient cultures. For example, in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, we find accounts of what are called vimanas, which are described as spaceships that can move from planet to planet. Or they even speak of more subtle kinds of vehicles that can move from dimension to dimension in the cosmos. And according to most of these ancient traditions, there have been interactions between beings higher in the cosmic hierarchy and beings existing at our terrestrial level. So this is something that we find evidence for in the wisdom traditions of various people down through history. We also find evidence for it in the modern UFO and alien abduction kinds of reports. For example, John Mack, who was head of the psychiatry department at Harvard University Medical School, started studying alien abduction reports. He concluded that the people reporting them were not psychotic or neurotic. He said they were reporting something real, something that they had actually experienced and that he found they were displaying symptoms of post-traumatic stress, which you would expect in cases like this. So even some scientists in the modern Western world have acknowledged the possibility that there may be interactions between terrestrial humans and extraterrestrial beings. So I think we shouldn't be surprised that we find such accounts also in these wisdom traditions of various people. And I think it's a possibility that we have to consider that these are not just fictional accounts, but they are real accounts. How close are these surface indicators to the tunnels that we're trying to find underground? A lot of times, they're right on top of them or within about 20 miles. What, what about right now? What are we? We are quite literally only about 10 miles from an actual underground or supposed underground base. Hold on, hold on a second. We're, right now, these are within, within 10 miles of what could be an underground base. Yes. And there would be an underground tunnel leading to that. Yes. And Is it, there any kind of route that we're close to, do you think, that, uh, pertaining to that map, like we saw the hubs out of Tonopah? We are close to the Tonopah Airport hub. Um, we're also close to the Groom Lake. Now, what's also interesting is, is not only are we 10 miles away from a supposed spiritual site, right. we are currently standing on a spiritual mountain. We're going to stay in this area. We right? are staying in this area. I knew he was going to do this to me. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. So we're going to stay in one of the areas that possibly is one of the most susceptible to alien visitation and possibly within reach of alien colonization on the base that's nearby. Yes. And matter of fact, uh, this is only the first site. <sighs> All right. Well, I think what we need to do is get camp set up. I agree, because it's starting to get dark. It's starting we're to get dark. And whatever it is that we're going to um, encounter tonight or not, um, we, uh, we need to at least be, be prepared.
The sun was setting as we headed up the mountain, trying to find a camp with a level spot for our tents. The fact that ancient people here on this site may have recorded actual accounts of alien encounters made me wonder if where we were might actually be a meeting ground or even a mountain that might hide a tunnel for alien transport. Our camping place was near an old cabin where men once lived while working a silver mine nearby. Of course, I had to make an Instagram post from here. We're currently in remote Nevada and came across this extraordinary old log cabin. Look at the size of these timbers. This is amazing right here. The size of each one, hand hewn. It's pretty incredible. But inside, there were clues as to the cabin's age and when it may have been inhabited, like this cardboard used for insulation, which still had a date on it. The men who posted this never could have known that just one month later would be the greatest stock market crash in history. Maybe in some way this cabin is like what Michael Cremo was talking about. Multiple phases had taken place inside the cabin over time, but it was all here, and it was still the same cabin. As it was getting dark, we set up camp in the most level spot we could find. With so much talk of aliens, both ancient and modern, I felt like I needed to sleep with my boots on in case they paid us a visit. Tomorrow was going to be a big day. We headed out the next morning. It seemed like endless driving through valleys and through low passes in the mountains. And finally, we hit the highway and headed to the little town of Rachel. So, Tim, this is the Little Ailey Inn. It's a landmark here in Nevada, right? Yes, it is. A lot of people don't realize it, but Rachel is actually the youngest town in Nevada. So when we came in, we kind of came in from the backside, like most people come in on the highway called the extraterrestrial highway, right? Yes, we actually cut off half the trip by just taking the back dirt roads from where I took you from the petroglyphs. Well, you know what's interesting about Rachel is I was here about 10 years ago, and we did an interview with Pat, who owns the little alien. And it was actually Pat that said, under Area 51 are bases, additional bases, which connect to bases in Death Valley. And that's where we first got this whole idea and, and heard this whole notion about Death Valley aliens, that there really would be a, a connector of some kind. There's a very good probability that tunnels from several places will go into the Death Valley area. I've heard about a colony of beings supposedly that are there. I can't prove it because I've not seen it. I've been told that there's some on Mount Irish, also in a tunnel. Can they go that far? I'm sure it could be done. What I hadn't paid attention to in Pat's interview until I heard it again for this project was that she mentions Mount Irish. That's where the cabin was and where we had spent the night. So we are here at the little alien and we were seeing if we could go in and talk to Pat again. It's been 10 years later, but uh, but Tim, you were telling me something came up. I actually overheard them saying that some people with top secret security clearance are actually going to be coming here to eat later on. And so we cannot film inside. So people coming here to the little alien with top secret clearances and they don't want anybody else in there. Well, it makes sense. I mean, because we are literally just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the base right now. Right, right. And th this is why this is the epicenter for ufologists and also for people who are trying to discover the conspiracies that are hidden over in Groom Lake. And when you say the base, we're talking about Area 51. Yes. Right, right. And so that's why this place is here is sort of a tourist attraction, the little alien, and 
and uh, it's on the extraterrestrial highway, so they really play it up, right? Yeah, sure, sure, well, play with the extraterrestrial. If you think about it, the state of Nevada is playing it up. Right. Because the, the extraterrestrial highway is not just a local designation. Yeah. It's actually the name that the state is given to the section to the, of the road. This part of this part of the road. So sure, the aliens are here. Of course, yes. enjoy them. Uh, the secret in plain sight, right? Oh yeah. Right, right. Yeah, out out in the open. Well, we have our next destination is where again? It's Quartzsite Mountain. Quartzsite Mountain. And it's believed to be an alien underground base is actually believed to be in that mountain. And what's interesting is, is if you go off of follow Sacred Mountain Top to Sacred Mountain Top, Quartzsite Mountain. It actually perfectly intersects with a direct line to the uh, from the mountain we were just on yep. to another mountain range that is considered sacred. Wow, wow. Well, I'm looking forward to that. So let's uh, let's go and talk about this a little bit. We're, okay. We're actually going to follow a GPS map. We're going to actually be doing that. Yeah, we're going to follow a GPS um, to the location okay. to make sure we don't get lost. Sure. turned off the extraterrestrial highway. Yes. And so we are now heading which direction now? We are heading southwest right now. Southwest. And we're heading towards Area 51. Yes. So at what point do they start, do you start getting security and that sort of thing? It's like right on the border. So they don't really, they don't really do anything unless you're really cross right over where the sign is. Well, it looks as, just as innocuous and kind of pretty is the other valley we were coming through that wasn't Area 51. Now how many times have you been on the border of Area 51? A couple times. So does it ever make you nervous? Like, like I feel a little nervous right now. Like this is something I've always heard about, Area 51, but I've never really ever gone to the border or seen, seen where it is. But it, it doesn't make me nervous for two reasons. I'm not doing anything wrong and I'm not crossing the border. Yeah, well, my friend that I was, I've been talking about, he... he Your friend that's going to do the interview with us? Yeah, I yeah, can't keep dreaming. Oh, uh, my friend, he actually was greeted by a gunship, an Apache gunship. You mean a helicopter? Yes. Whoa. But he was kind of an idiot and drew, drove a little bit further in than he should have. But well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to test the boundaries. We're not going to do any of that stuff. What our goal is, is to really find, as we've said a number of times, to really find these tunnel connections, these uh, locations both above ground and potentially underground that would give us some indication that there are tunnels that go from Area 51 to Death Valley and to other places and potentially having that hub up there in Donabon. That would be interesting. We got cows. So are they are they grazing on DOD land? Are they grazing on Department of Defense land? No, they're actually grazing on BLM right now. This is Bureau of Land Management. So are we heading straight to Area 51 now? We're heading straight for one of their remote gates. Straight for a remote gate. Oh, man. This kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Oh, we get too close. We got to find out. Now, can we shoot on this side? We can shoot on this side. So we're actually looking at Area 51 right there. We are looking right at it. That mountain way off there in the distance, Yeah. that's Quartzsite Mountain. That's Quartzsite Mountain. Are we being watched right now? We are most likely being watched because there's there's camera up there. We're uh, way up there on that facility. Okay. There's probably cameras up over there. So, yeah, so they, they know we're here. That's crazy. It's crazy because it makes my stomach flutter a little bit, you know, because you've heard about it, you've, you've, you know, and, and, and you've seen documentaries about Area 51. It's so famous. It's so well known. And here we are at the border. So my question is, when they say photography of this area prohibited, like, would they see us shooting here? 
And shooting into the area? Would that be a problem? No, it isn't. The, the photography actually pertains to people that are physically on the base. So they can't do anything if we're on this side? No. They can come out and question us, but mm -hmm. that's about all they can do. Because we haven't done anything. Well, I guess let's get out and take a look. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pull around. All right. So we're not blocking the road just in case they do come by because you can see by the tracks that they are traveling it. And that's another road. Uh, it's a fence line road. Ah, so they can monitor this fence. No, it's, it's so that they have to repair the fence because of the cattle, because the cattle's going to bust up the fence. Because they're going to, uh, you know that saying, everything's greener on the other side. Yeah, yeah, of course. C cows are the epitome of that. Right, right. This is the gate to Area 51. Well, what, this is one of the gates. One of the gates. But it's got enough signs to let you know. Oh my gosh, Tim, so this is it. This is Area 51. Yes, so Tim, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually like, like quasi trespassing here, right? I'm partly in Area 51. That just means they'll arrest your hands. Oh, great. <laughs> but clearly they don't like pictures around here. No, and uh, that's why I kind of like to have us hurry up and finish this. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. We, we don't know how they're going to react to us. They may be nice. They may be a little bit mad. Mad, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but it's incredible, though, that we're here, and, and you pointed out, you said that mountain down there, that's that's Quartzite Mountain there that we can see? That Yes, that is Quartzite Mountain. Yeah. And that is where the supposed underground alien base is located. I see. So, so we could actually be looking at an area right now where they have stored the aliens. Well, not really store them, it's supposed to be the location where we've given them an underground base. An active base, like a colony. Yes. So we've, we've allowed them to sort of colonize Quartzite Mountain. For our purposes and what we're concerned about is the potential that, that there might be tunnels that lead from the colony of Quartzite into various areas around here. Right? Yes. And, and even all the way to Death Valley, that these, that these tunnels might be corridors for transporting aliens so people can't see them, that kind of thing, to various bases. Yeah, and where we stayed the night, like I said, that's spiritual mountain. If you actually take the UFO petroglyph that I showed you, yeah. or the unidentified petroglyph, right. and you actually run a straight line, it actually goes through Quartzsite, right past Lida, through Deep Springs in California, over to where there's another UFO petroglyph. So it's, it's like a, a straight above ground ancient pathway. Yes. And and we believe that that may parallel an underground pathway that either may be as ancient or follows that 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 path. Yeah, because it, it, it has two fo uh, focuses. First is you have these weird alien UFO type glyphs right. that you really can't explain. And then on top of it, you listen to the Shoshone Paiute legend, it's following the spiritual lines. Right. Can't believe we're out here. I've never been to this border of this base, of yes. Area 51. You had said there was a series of lakes, you said, that were sort of concentric circles. So describe that to me and, and so, um, so we can kind of visualize that. Essentially, there's, there's circles that come out from a central point, and a lot of ufologists who see these these are like little lake beds? They're dry lake beds. Dry lake beds, and they're, they're in circles, and they're varying sizes. Yes, and a lot of ufologists believe these are actually landing pads. This is all, this is all getting way, way too interesting. Way too interesting. This is, a, this is really fascinating. So what's our next destination in relationship to this? So we understand that we're here because of the Native American, the spiritual connection, the, 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 the connection between the petroglyphs leading us this way, Area 51 being right on the path. What's our next destination now for tonight? Our next destination is to an area called Project Faultless, which was a DOE site where they were um, detonating nuclear explosions underground. And you think possibly for what purpose? It's not what I believe. It's Again, what a lot of ufologists believe. Your friend. Um, one of my friend being one of them. That we're going to interview. Eh, no. Okay. Um, and he believes they're using the nuclear explosion as a cover story for other events. Be it a, ton a new tunneling machine put in place, a new underground base yeah. was being built. Yeah. 
this has been extraordinary being here being right on the border seeing that it's guarded with just a little padlock there the and a flimsy chain and a, a, and a little chain, bit of chain link a little chain link well let's let's leave the border of area 51 let's go see if we can find the connector to to port site okay all right well it was incredible being at the border of area 51 just the idea that we were being watched that crossing the border as remote as it was could literally end up in a confrontation with the famous commandos or even a Black Hawk or Apache helicopter. We've been driving for a while now. We turned off the camera and we turned off sound and everything just so we could keep driving. But it's been a while since we've seen anything like services and certainly back here where we are in these dirt roads this is really really remote Nevada. Yeah as a matter of fact uh, we don't see services until Eureka which is about another 150 miles away. Wow. Now remember I told you about the network of runways that were used for the projects out here for the project faultless and the other uh, four? Right. We are currently right now on one of the runways. This was one of the runways? This was one of the runways. It was actually a section. It was actually an X-shaped runway. And then there was another runway that ran parallel over this direction here. Man, it has been such a ride out here. Where are we? Are we getting there, Tim? Yes, we are actually turning right now. Project Fitness. Oh my gosh, wait, look at this is great. Look at this. This is like a transition into another world. Look at that mountain ahead of us. This dirt road through this little cut in the, in the road. I mean, it looks like we're going into another land, honestly. But wait until we get on the other side. Glad I took my nap earlier because I'm wide awake now. <laughs> but nothing will get me more awake than trying to find these tunnels connected to Area 51. Just think of the activity that took place out here. All of the activity, nuclear activity, people running around with a bomb, a bomb, a nuclear bomb out here. When we get to the point that uh, we are not allowed to dig or pick up any rocks. We can't pick the dig or pick up any rocks at the location we're going to? Yes, they actually have signs that actually say that because it's still hot. So it's still radioactive? The ground underneath where we're going to be standing is still molten. What's our risk of exposure to that? Very minimal. Because they say it's safe. Because it's so far underground? Yes. But the rocks could be radioactive. Yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know how that works. There is Project Faultless. That's it? That is Project Faultless. That's it. There's a marker on it. Yes. Now, before we get out, yeah. you see how tall that caisson is? Yes. The ground used to be level with it. The ground used to be level with it? Yes. So what happened? It's because the ground underneath melted and it sank. So this was all higher? Yes. When did they do this? This was in the 60s. Wow. So let's go take a look at the plaque. All right. So here is this thing, Tim. Look at that marker and everything. A nuclear detonation was conducted below this spot at a depth of 3,200 feet. The device with a yield of less than one megaton was detonated to determine the environmental and structural effects that might be expected should subsequent higher yield underground nuclear tests be conducted in this vicinity. That's a lot of words. Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of words to tell us what they were doing here. They lowered an atomic bomb into the ground right where we were standing. There were measuring devices around the site. They wanted to see how the bomb would affect the surface and if there were in fact faults that would be impacted by the blast. The aerial shot here shows the moment of explosion and how the ground actually sank. Today, it's obvious that Ground Zero sits in what is essentially a nuclear-made crater. But we know there are other reasons why they might have put this here, why they might have done 
this particular test here, right? There are other reasons. Yeah, it has been speculated by my friend and some others that this is was one of the connecting tunnels to the alien underground base network. Right. A problem arised. They, they don't know what problem it was, but all they knew was they believe that this was drilled, a nuclear weapon was lowered in there to seal off the tunnel. That was one of the theories. The other theory is that they lowered these new TBMs, uh, tunnel boring machines, underground. Like those really big round ones that, yes. that uh, cut away. But the, what they believed is, is this, plus also all the other drill holes, were used to lower these new drilling machines to build an underground base. These drilling devices were suppo are, are supposedly new ultrasonic ones that vaporize rock. What's really fascinating is that, that this place really could be an underground base, could be an underground tunnel. Uh, we could have aliens 3,200 feet below us, or at least a tunnel to quartzite maybe, right? The base over on Area 51. What about our mystical lines over the the, the, the Native American, the, the petroglyphs. Now, the petroglyph panel I took you to is a little bit further south than this location. All right. But there is another one, quite literally 22 miles over this hill. Okay. Okay. And its line connects directly up to a spiritual line. So we're pretty close to just being on the route, either to the Nevada test site, to Area 51, or within the, the spiritual connector of the petroglyphs. Yes. Now this part is in no excavation, drilling, and or removal of materials is permitted without government approval within a horizontal distance of 3,300 feet from the surface ground zero. They call this ground zero location, Nevada State coordinates. And so within 3,300 feet, basically two thirds of a mile, right? Yes. You cannot pick up anything, you can't dig, within within a circumference, a radius of here rather, of 3,300 feet from ground zero. And you can't camp nothing. Wow, wow. That's incredible because they're afraid that it's because of the radiation from underground was seeping up and little rock that you take home for a souvenir all of a sudden becomes the your worst enemy. <laughs> I cannot pick up the smallest stone, even that one, nor should I be touching it. Because 51 years later, apparently these little rocks here could all be radioactive. Because right there is Project Fallas. And here am I. You can see my foot. None of this can be touched. This rock here, I am prohibited by law from touching that rock right there. And so I didn't. But it really makes you wonder why. Is it just because all of these rocks are radioactive? And then if they are radioactive, then how is it possible that the site is safe? So it makes you wonder then, well, if it's safe and they're not really radioactive and I can be in here, but I just can't pick up a rock, did they just make that up? Did they just make it up that it's radioactive and I can't touch a rock to distract me from the fact that underneath that thing right there is an alien base or an alien tunnel? Is that what they're doing? Tim was doing the drone shot and I was getting a little behind the scenes while I was exploring the radiation here. But Tim, tell us the problem with you getting this drone shot. The problem is, is when I get above the casein um, uh, and start hovering above the cement that's over there, uh, the cement plug, all the electronics inside the drone go haywire. Whoa. They literally, liter but then when you get away from it, it's okay? When you get about 25 feet away, there's no problem. But any closer, especially on top of it, the compass goes haywire. The IMU, which is a um, control system to determine where it is in space, goes haywire. It loses all GPS satellites. It's just very strange. Right now? Right now, this just happened? Yes. It actually has happened twice. Um, both times I went up above the drone or above the casing. Because I saw you were frustrated. You were frustrated at one point. You're like, oh, why isn't this thing working? Is that what it was? That was it. So Tim flags me down while I'm out here looking at this thing and says he's got an idea for how to check what's going on. What's going on, Tim? 
Okay, I have an EM meter, uh, an electromagnetic meter. Basically, it reads how much electromagnetic discharge is coming off of an item. An electromagnetic discharge. What would that be? What would be an electromagnetic discharge? Uh, such as a uh, electrical wire, a paneling, a bad light bulb. Like a solar panel or electrical no, no, no. panel. Uh, electrical panel. Like an electrical panel, okay. Okay. Um, Anything, anything dealing with electricity that will generates electri electricity. Yes. Something that generates we electricity. We generate electricity. The planet itself, its background EM radiation is um, anywhere from 300 to about 400 milligauss. Okay. All right. So I wanted to see what was causing the drone to go haywire. Okay. So I pulled out an EM meter, and if you come here. Okay. We're pretty high in this area at this point we're 900 but watch what happens when we get closer to the caisson okay it's it's going crazy it's going up the higher we go and the longer we sit here the actually the higher it will become at one point i had it up at about 29 100 milligauss. So what does that tell you about this thing? It's generating some type of electromagnetic field. Matter of fact, when I did it last time, here was about 1200 milligauss. So it's actually dissipating now. Whoa, so it's some sort of field that goes in and out. Yes, it's actually fluctuating. Maybe with aliens beneath us that are generating electromagnetic fields in and out as they it go could. through the tunnels. But what's amazing is, is the higher you go, the more, uh, the higher it goes. The higher it goes. And that's where the drone was going haywire. Wow. Because the drone's gonna cease working. Um, it's avo uh, collision avoidance system, it's compass, all that is affected by EM. Whoa, that's so crazy. This thing, had you ever seen it go like that? Can we see it one more time? Sure. Had you ever seen it go crazy like that? Only when I put it next to an electrical box when I was trying to find a blown fuse. So we got low. Yeah. In the 500s, and we're just steadily climbing the higher we go. Let's see, let's see, let me get in there. That is just like going nuts. Is that going nuts to you? Yeah, it is. Because like I said, background's anywhere from three to 400. And now we're going down, so yeah. we're going down the caisson. And this is the amazing part. When we get down to the ground, Yeah. So now we're going back up Go again. Back up again. Whoa, hold it, hold it, hold it. There we go. Let's go back to the ground again. Whoa, it's going back up again. What would explain that? There has to be something electromagnetic in this that's radiating. Now, the nuclear explosion underground and the reaction, since it's molten underneath us, yeah. the molten rock can be causing an electromagnetic field. Yeah. Or, if you want to go towards the realm of the aliens, now you can say, maybe there is an underground base down below this plug. Tim, that was incredible. That's, that was one of the most fascinating experiences I've had in the world of aliens here. This is really interesting. It's actually pretty surreal and to think that this is not on a um, government facility. That's the amazing part. That is the amazing part. No, we had to go through a government facility to get here. Yes. And, and, they, and well, they still monitor the area. And I'm sure they do because they have those restrictions. I couldn't touch the rock, if you remember. Yeah, last time I was out here, they had much they had more signs, more signage. Maybe yeah. it was causing too much, um, bit, yeah, people were just starting to see it, and they figured if it's less obvious, less people will come out. Right. Okay, so here's my assessment of this place. One, okay, you detonated a nuclear bomb for some reason. Two, your explanation of the reason on this historical plaque makes no sense, or it's just convoluted enough to be a little confusing. They say it's about could this area withstand more nuclear tests? So it was like a test for tests. Yes. So, okay, whatever. And and then thirdly, you go out and you get this 
command that you're not allowed to touch these rocks because they're radioactive, but oh, we don't have this fenced off or anything. It's okay for you to come on out. And then you are doing a drone B-roll for us. And I hear you going, what the heck is going on? And your drone's going out of control. Zeroed out the ground. And it thought that it was that it was um, coming in for a landing, and it was coming in for a landing very fast, right on the top. Would have been on the top of the budget faultless mark. Yes, and right there, the case off. Yeah, it would have came right down on that, and it would have hit hard. And then the fifth thing that happens is, well, I decided to take my ghost radar over, which was going fast, by the way. And then you see me do that, and then you're like, well, let me get the real thing. Let me get this EM on which again is EM stands for electromagnetic electromagnetic monitor. And then this is the fifth piece of evidence. The fifth thing that happens is what? It just goes haywire. It, it goes it, nuts. It goes up. And the higher you turn up the caisson, it, uh, it gets stronger, which uh, in reality it should be getting weaker. Project Faultless is a mysterious site. Could easily be a portal could easily be significant in the world of aliens, extraterrestrials, tunnels, and the fact that evidence six is that it's pretty close to being on the mystic petroglyph trail. Project Fallus is an amazing place. And for that reason, we're not gonna actually give the exact location of any of these places that we visit. But we feel like what we're doing is gathering evidence to, to, to suggest that these tunnels may exist, that aliens are transported back and forth from to these bases. Maybe not on Area 51, but we've come to a very, very interesting part of Nevada and the secrecy behind these bases, tunnels, and aliens. When we left Project Faultless, we headed back near Area 51. Tim and I agreed that the places we had been all had a weird, dark, even sinister feeling that you could cut with a knife. We stopped for the night in an area with unusual formations, which seemed filled with caves and possibly even portals. We didn't know what we might be in for as night approached, lights, orbs, or something else. But it was time to review where we had been. We really are right on the right on the boundary there. And it's interesting, all this top topography here, those strange rock formations out there that we see. Um, it's you know, just all over the place. It is, it is. And it's an interesting place to have the boundary. It's an interesting place to think about the tunnels. It's an interesting place to think about potential bases underneath there. Yes, and right here. Mm -hmm just over the but just literally a half mile away from the test site border now if we go ahead and look at where we have been okay so here's rachel mm -hmm. okay we shot on up to the road we right. came over here we visited the base here okay okay the mountain quartzite mountain was right over here oh. okay then we w got back on the highway went over to Project Faultless, which is up here. Hmm. Then we came back down across the six, yeah. went south again, and now we're sitting back here. Again, if we actually look and we say we crawled up crawled up to the border, yeah. okay, and looked at the ridge line there, yeah. we would actually see the Quartzite Mountain. Quartzite Mountain. Project Faultless, Area 51, and those unusual ancient petroglyphs. All strange in their own right, but what did they add up to, if anything? Later that evening, Tim thought he saw something, possibly a light disappearing into the formations. 
he headed out to the backcountry to search for a possible portal in the strange rocks. I stayed at base camp. But he went out quite a ways looking, but soon felt like it would be unwise to go much farther. We were too close to Area 51. Oh, I wish I could shoot out a little bit further. Tim made his way back to camp, and I went out to meet him. And that was the end of the hunt. We do, I mean, we're on the edge of Area 51. We're, clo we're close to, we're, we, we are literally at the, at the base of a spiritual mountain. Yep. We are on a spiritual track point. Right. To another spiritual place. Right. So what are we chasing here? We've got a lot of exploring to do. Yes, we do. And that should be the end of the show. But when we were editing, I saw something. There it is. Did you see that? Tim had missed it out in the field. So I gave him a call and asked him what it was. I was just wondering if you had seen it or if it was something we missed or if it, or what the heck it might be. I mean, it just looks really odd, <laughs> to say the least. The first thing that went through my head was, is we are on a very spiritual mountain. I mean, we, we are talking about a mountain where a lot of rituals were done and even vision questing was done. Right. Um, we, we were very close to a supposed underground base, Quartzite Mountain. Right, right. Um, could, could it have been something else that was emanating from the base? Right. And so a lot of... A lot of questions were going through my head, too, when I was reviewing the footage. Right, and that's what I was wondering, like, I mean, you know, we're looking for the big things, right? We're looking for the UFO and the little green guys to come popping out and the reptilians or whatever. But, you know, I mean, does does some stuff, does some evidence show up as just sort of small stuff like this? Well, the, I went ahead and I watched it several times. Yeah. Um, trying to figure out why I didn't see it. Yeah. So I just kept watching and watching and so finally I decided to zoom in and I hate to bust your bubble, but I think it was a moth. Um, a moth? A moth, <laughs> because you can actually see the wings moving when you zoom in really close. Wow. Wow. It just looks so otherworldly. I mean, really, I mean, when you just look at it, it doesn't, it does really doesn't even resemble a moth. But now that you mention it, I guess I can see it in there. Yeah, I mean, it's understandable to believe that this could have been something else because we were on a very sacred mountain. We're not out of the realm of possibilities that it could be metaphysical or paranormal or something else. Right, right. But moth or not, is it possible that this place is alive with activity from other dimensions? Maybe other worlds? Are we the newbies on the block? Those in charge at Area 51 would surely know about this, but perhaps there's nothing they can do. They're just employees, powerless to do anything about whatever is behind UFOs and other phenomena. And could it be that there's a paranormal aspect to all this? The UFOs apparently interacting with select witnesses? After exploring the bordering formations and phenomenon of Area 51 and seeking ancient clues, come back and the storm area 51 thing hit the next day coincidence you never know but one thing's for sure there's speculation that the aliens are here and have a base in a valley named death while we continue to gather evidence on its borders it seems that all roads lead there and that we may soon encounter death valley aliens